Well, praise God. Y'all glad to be in church this morning? Yeah. Well, I'm glad y'all are here. I'm glad everybody's out there listening and watching this morning. And, you know, a couple of things I want to just, so we all get on the same page here. You know, uh, we have a, we have a, a group of, of, and some of y'all may not have met them because Sister Annie hasn't been here in a lot of years, but uh, we work with a group in Mexico. Uh, they actually live in Alamo. They have a great church there, Bethany Outreach Center. Uh, and so Sister Annie, we've built churches with them. They have a, hundreds of churches in Mexico, and we've worked with them for, for forever, forever. And uh, she was telling me, because I, I talk with her at least every couple of weeks, and we visit, and, and she was telling me, because my heart has been yearning just to see uh, God moving amongst all of us. But in a way, like I want to, I, I mean, like I'm kind of being picky. I got to tell you. Because I don't want to have a healing line. I don't want you to have to come to the front. I don't want it to do it like, I don't want it to come up here and it has anything to do with me. I want it to be so, totally the Holy Ghost. I want you just to come into church and as you walk into the doors of the church and as you're worshiping God here just to get healed right there. I want you to be able to say nobody touched you but the Holy Ghost. And so we've been talking about this and she's been saying the same thing and she's just been praying. And, and the other day she told me this story and I think I need to tell y'all that in their service that there was a couple that had a child and the child had, I can't remember exactly what the disease was, it was something devastating like spina bifida or something. It was the child was really deformed and, and very, very small and uh, couldn't walk inactive, whatever. It's like two years old and never had walked, never couldn't hardly move, couldn't do anything. It's just a really, really sad sight. And so uh, during the service, Sister Annie was just going along just like we do. Just, I mean, there's no difference. The same anointings here as there. I'm telling you, church. But it takes the faith of the people. And they were just going along the service, and all of a sudden, this child for the very first time just started, when, when Sister Annie was saying something like, amen, or praise God, the child started moving. And they're all like, you know, the, the family was amazed. I mean, it wasn't much, you know, but it was something that the child had never done. And this child over the weeks that have been going by, since this happened, it's been months that this has been going by. Now, all of a sudden, the child is up in church saying amen, praise God, and walking. So what I'm saying is, that's God. And I know he wants to do that, and I really believe with all of my heart that, this, that, that God is wanting to move in that way. So when you're in service and you're coming sitting here right now, I mean, it's just because they're not praise and worship. I mean, not now. At any moment, you just need to have your heart set for God to just touch you. I really believe this morning as I preach this message, we're going to have some fun this morning, but I, I, I really believe that God is going to touch you. I believe you're going to be delivered from oppression. I believe that if you've worried about anything this morning, you got something burying down on you and you feel like it's boring down on you and, 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 and you you're, have oppression on you this morning, it's going to be gone at the end of the service. Okay, if you'll just grab hold of this message. So the title of this message this morning is How Big's Your Daddy? You know, like two little boys going out on a playground, getting a fight, and, they, and then one of them says, well, my daddy can whip your daddy. Well, this past week, I had to uh, uh, go to a, a, a wedding out in West Texas, and we took some time off, and we went out, and I love I loved West Texas, and, and I love the bigness and the vastness of it, and we went through Big Bend, and we were driving around, and, and I was just blown away because, well, two things. One is it rained on us for three days. I didn't know it ever rained in the desert. It just rained when we were there. I mean, my gosh. I mean, we're, we're in some trouble, folks, when it's raining in Terlingua, okay? So anyway, but we went through Big Ben, and I just get amazed at the, at the, at the, the vastness of that area. You know, it's hard to believe that it's Texas. And you, you, you just look at it, and those, those huge mountains and those sheer bluffs and then the vastness of the, of the desert floor, and, and, and you get around all that bigness. It makes me just feel how big our God is. And we drove around and went all the different places looking at things, and you just drive up, and you're just like, wow. And you're just thinking, man, you know, uh, this, look at how awesome this is. But how big is our God? You with me? I mean, it's, it, it, how many breathtaking things are there in, in the world that you can see, you know? I remember the first time, 
that we were uh, over in Africa years ago when we were going to go see Victoria Falls. And I'm like, okay, Victoria Falls, you know, whatever. I don't know, some, some river flow or whatever, you know. I mean, I'm thinking like, you know, something we see around here. And I remember we began to walk over there towards that thing and hearing that thing roar. And I was like, what? It ain't going to be bigger than I thought it was. And then all of a sudden I realized that, it, you know, they're talking about it's raining there. And I was like, raining? It's clear sky? I said, no, 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 it has its own it, it develops its own clouds. I'm like, what? what are we talking about? Oh, yeah, it develops its own clouds, in it, and you've got to go through a section that it's going to rain on you. I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I went over there and stood at the edge going, that's a waterfall. And there's things like that in life, you know, that you see, there's natural things, but then you're talking about, you're talking about our God who created it, and he didn't do any, he didn't strain over it. It didn't take him a million years to make it. Are you with me? He spoke it into existence, and it was created. And you talk about a God doing that, when we're awed at that, imagine what God is. And so I want to read some things to you this morning. Go to Galatians chapter 4. Get your Bibles out. And go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 4. Galatians 4.4 4 says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore you are no longer a slave, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. Hello, sons. Now think about this this morning. I, I have to laugh because I, I can't, you know, the, the world is crazy. I just was coming in this morning, I was listening to a Billy Graham message preaching in 1958, and he was talking about them, how dark and how black the world is today. And how, how dark the, the, the United States is. And they were not even a Christian nation anymore. And he's going along saying this. And I'm like, dude, you know, huh, thank God you're in heaven. Looking at the craziness going on in the world today. But everybody wants to argue about everything. And I just really don't want to argue about it. I just want to preach the truth and just go on. But there's a, it says here, our hearts are crying out, Abba, Father. Well, the word Abba is an Aramaic term, and it's only used three times in the New Testament. And it means father. And, and so, but I'd heard a message a long time ago of a guy saying that the true meaning of it means daddy. A little different. And uh, so then I got to looking up on the internet this morning, looking around different things just to confirm some stuff. And, 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 and it, they're, just, they're, they're fighting over what does Abba mean. And I'm like, my Lord, folks. Can't we get an agreement on anything, you know? Some are saying, that's just, just horrible. That's just disrespectful to God to say, Daddy. It's just not, can't be Daddy because it's Father. You know, it's, it's Abba. It's the, and then another one person said, it was the only word they had. It was either like you call him Buck or Abba. I mean, there was no other word. So it doesn't make any difference. You know what I'm saying? It, it was a mute point. And then another one says, oh, no, it means daddy, daddy. It means it's a, but so let me just tell you something. Let me tell you what. I'm going to show you this in a minute, but let me just tell you what my heart says, okay? He says, your heart was crying out, Abba, Father. Well, you know, my son can call me anything from pops to pop to dad to hey to whatever, but he's my son. Hello? He can get away with it. And our relationship between each other I don't really care what he calls me. Are you following me? As long as it's not sarcastic or something. <laughs> right? I don't, I'm not big on the term, you'll call me father. Hello? When he says Abba here, he's saying that there's something in us that cries out that you're my father. I have a relationship with you. You're, you're my daddy. I, I recognize him. I know my daddy. You all with me? There's something in you when you're born again that says, God is my father. Now, this God I'm talking about is the same God that created the world. 
that put everything together, this huge, amazing, awesome God, is also my daddy. Are y'all following me here? So who's your daddy? Sometimes in life we have to stop. When the world wants to throw junk at us, when the world wants to throw oppression at us, when the world wants to throw sickness at us, when the world wants to throw worry at us, when the world wants to throw this, that, and the other at us, we have to stop for a minute and say, wait a minute, who's my daddy? And something has to rise on the inside of you because spiritually speaking, if you're saved, you're born again. Down on the inside of you, you should know who your daddy is. So all of a sudden, you know, you, 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 want to, you really want to tear off a piece of me when this is my daddy? Think of the story of the prodigal son. I don't want to read all the way through it, but you know the story of the prodigal son, Luke 15. And, you know, the, 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 the man had two sons, right? And the younger son said, I want to go off and I want to go spend. I want to go do what I want to go do. I want to do what I want to go do. So he went and did it, and it was a bad decision. He ended up out. With nothing, he ended up shipwrecked. He ended up eat, wanting to eat the pig food, not even getting that. He ended up in the worst place of life. But then it says he came to himself. He came to his senses. He snapped up to his, wait a minute. What was he saying? My father's, at my father's house, my servants, they're not hungry. At my father's house, my, fa- my servants, they're, 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 they're protected. They got a roof over their head. See, he came to himself and he grabbed hold of who's his daddy. And church, what the devil wants to do to us in life and what this world situation wants to do to us in this circumstances life, it wants to pull us away and think that our daddy has abandoned us. And to get us to thinking that, that well, God, you know, he's, he's, he's up there and he's mysterious and he's whatever and he's, he can't, you know, he, he, will he move or will he not or will he do this and all. And we start second guessing ourselves. My children, they know me. They know my, they know my life. They know who I am. They know what I'm going to do. And, you know, they a lot of times don't even ask. They just take. And they know I'm not going to get mad about it. I may say, where is that? What did y'all do with it? I can't find my whatever. And then they're going to say, oh, well, you know, I got it over here. But I don't, I, I'm not saying, that's it. You're disinherited. You're following me. But why do we do that with God? Why do we let the devil talk us into those situations and circumstances to think that we're all alone trying to fight it out in life, trying to get through whatever the situation is, trying to to, to work it all out within our own strength and take us into a place of worry instead of resting in the palm of our Father's hand. John 10, 29 says, man, I'm in the palm of my Father's hand and ain't nothing going to take me out. Hello? Hello? That's the trick of the enemy to take you out, to get you out there to believe in that, you know, you can't do it. And so what happens? Okay, well, listen to me. Let's just put Abba in perspective using Jesus' story of the prodigal son. Is that okay? I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying what Jesus said. I'm not trying to make it up or do anything else. I'm just telling you what Jesus said. He uses stories in illustration. Remember the prodigal son comes home? He's coming down the road. He's got his speech all lined up. And it says, and the father sees him, and the father runs to him. He's trying to show you an image of who the father is. He's trying to show you who this heavenly father is. And I'm sorry, but we've gotten it wrong a lot in church. We've portrayed a father who is like more like the Wizard of Oz. I am the great and powerful Oz. Smoke and fire. How dare you come into my presence? Y'all with me? That's what religion has p- portrayed. Oh, well, you don't do it right. You didn't do this right. You didn't do that right. You didn't. Oh, man, you did that. You did this and not that. You're going to come in here, man. You better get all your praying done before you ever get up. He's going to kill you. He's going to smoke you right there in the front. Am I right? It's like. like I, I, you you got to understand me as a child. I was raised in church and I would. And, and I would. And. and, and you know, God bless them. I, I'm not by any means trying to be critical or anything like that. But in my imagery, as a child just sitting there, I see them go through their prayer list. They had the prayer list. And they would get up there every Sunday, and they'd go through the prayer list. And then it would be a few weeks, and they would be 
making announcements for the funeral services that they were doing. And as a child, it got in my head, my God, I don't want to be on that list. (laughs) Because I didn't see it as the answer to prayer miracle list. I saw it as the death list. If your name came up, you're dead. Now, nobody was teaching me that. I'm just saying that was me uh, just reading this and just seeing the preacher goes up there. We need to pray for so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. And then next week, uh, funeral arrangements this week will be for so-and-so. I'm sorry. He just, are y'all with me? That's why I want to see a church of miracles. I want to see a church of this awesome daddy that we got moving in our midst when our hearts are open to receive from him. But if you think daddy's the great and powerful laws, if you think that you, oh my gosh, you don't go, you're not going to have a relationship with him. You're not going to know him as Abba Father, and you're not going to be receiving anything from him because you're going to want to be keeping away because you just might get found out and then get spanked. Hello? But what happens? Jesus shows us the father. He goes to him. He runs down the road. He grabs the son and he kisses him before the son says anything. Do you hear me, church? Before the son got his speech out that he'd all worked up, before he got his all, you know, everything all slick willied out to give to the father, before he got there, the father ran up there and kissed him and already told the servants, hey, bring the, bring, bring the robe, bring the ring, bring the sandals, kill the fatted calf. He's trying to show us the father. So don't go tell me that Abba doesn't mean daddy, daddy. Because Jesus is trying to give us the illustration here and an understanding of what the Father's relationship to us is. Hello? He ran to him, kissed him, put the ring on his finger. The son's still trying to say anything. Do you ever, if you read the story in there, go read it this afternoon. You go read the story. The father never addressed anything the kid said. He's over there stammering around, repenting the whole time. I'm not worthy to be coming in. The father ain't even paying any attention to him. He's not paying any attention to him. He's not paying attention to him because, see, the miracle happened in the pig pen when he came to himself, and the father already knew that because he's looking at the heart. He's not looking at the great speech he had. He's looking at the heart. God already knew. Father Abba already knew in the pig pen the son was right. And then he just finally made it home. Are y'all with me? Okay. And then, of course, there was the, there was the, uh, young, the older brother. He's all mad. He's all huffy. I can't believe it. He had been out, wasted all of his good. Blah, blah, blah. He's out there. Because, see, he was working for his righteousness. He was into works, and he was working for his righteousness. And he thought his father should give him something because he worked for him. But do you notice something? The elder brother never had a heart change. Never. And see, folks, that's what God's looking for. He's looking for your heart change. You want to keep a relationship with your heavenly father like Abba Father? Just keep your heart pliable. Keep your heart pure. Keep your heart to where when you turn to him, he'll always be there. So how big's your daddy? I want to go to another scripture, Isaiah 40. Go to Isaiah 40, verse 26. I thought this was interesting. May not be totally 100% true because whenever I get something not out of the Bible or just out of facts, it could be wrong. Have y'all noticed? I, I, I'm not, again, I'm not wanting to complain this morning, but have y'all noticed that, you know, <clears throat> like, like for instance, I know most of y'all probably understand this, but you know, a lot of, we have a lot of arrowheads around here. We hunt arrowheads, you know, and there's what's called a Clovis point, which a Clovis point we've always known. we always taught. Everybody always said that was the oldest kind of point because of the shape of it and all like that. And so that's what we learned. So if you were going to go to, I don't know, I don't know if they have a class on arrowheads in Sol Ross, but if they did, you were taking a test, they'd say, what is the oldest point? You should have wrote Clovis point. And if you didn't, you'd have got it wrong and you'd have, you'd have failed. Hello? But now they just found some new arrowheads. And now they're saying that's not the oldest point. There's another point out there. I'm like, how can you guys stand up and tell us it's truth? And then all of a sudden you come out, well, that wasn't really right. Now, this is it. And so it makes me just feel like you don't know what you're talking about. Hello? But I love the word of God because the word of God, you can know what you're talking about. So my facts may not all be the truth here, but it says right here in Isaiah 40, this is the truth. Lift up your eyes on high. And see who has created these things. 
who brings out the host by number and calls them all by name. By the greatness of his might and the strength of his power, not one is missing. God says he knows how many stars there are. He put them there and he knows whatever name of them is and everyone's hanging there. And it will stay there as long as it's supposed to. Hello? So it made me start thinking about how many stars are there. I mean, I love this time of year. This is the greatest time of year. If it would ever stop raining and we can see. But when the clouds are out and it gets those crisp nights and you look up in their sky and you see the Milky Way and you see all the stars and you can just stand outside and just, wow. It's so amazing to me because you, so folks, sometimes we have what I call situational blindness. In other words, you can be living here and not even take it, you take it all for granted. You don't, you, you don't even appreciate it. You don't even see it. But we'll have guests come out here and, you know, from the city, and they're just like, oh, God, look at the stars. And I'm like, yeah, I ought to come out here more often and look at this. You know, it's pretty, pretty, but, you know. And they're blown away. We had a couple here one time had never seen it lightning. Never seen it lightning. They're from Europe, and it doesn't lightning over there. It'll rain, but it doesn't lightning. So we, it was a big thunderstorm, so we went out, out into the, uh, between here and Sab now, on the flat out there, and stopped and let them see the, the thunderstorm go by. And they were just, oh, I can't believe it all. Lightning striking everywhere. I'm like, yeah, usually we go in the house about this time. But, <laughs> but you know, you can get situational blindness you, you, where you just, you, you just become blind to what the beauty is around you. And we don't look at the stars, but I, I read this. You know, like I said, this is off the Internet, so it could be right or not. But there's 20 billion stars in the Milky Way galaxy alone. 20 billion. And then they say that there's probably 100 billion galaxies that can be seen out of the Hubble te telescope. That's a lot of stars, folks, all I'm trying to say. That may not maybe may give or take a couple of billion. <laughs> That's a lot of stars. Hello? And my Bible says God put them all in there and he knows them all by name. Are you starting to just, just think of that? Have y'all noticed this? This is kind of off topic a little bit, but you know, I used to remember everybody's phone number. I used to remember everybody's phone number. I mean, somebody wanted to know the phone number. Now I've speed dialed so much or told Siri to call so-and-so or whatever. I don't remember anybody's number anymore. Hello? I hope it's not age. Hope it's just that I didn't keep it up with the. It's not AIDS. That's all right. But you follow what I'm saying? We used to, I could remember that. You're going to remember every name of every star of the billions and billions? I'm trying to get you this morning to open up your mind to think of the vastness of God and then how small your problem really is. And if God can take care of all of that, Surely he can take care of what's going on in your life if you're just believing. My daddy's big. My daddy's big. It's not anything really that my daddy can't do. He made me out of dirt. Surely he can fix it. Are you following what I'm saying? God Almighty breathed into me. And man came alive. That's my daddy who breathes into mud and it comes alive. And that's my daddy who wants to have a relationship with me, who wants to call and put the ring on my finger and the shoes on my feet and give me the authority and the robe of righteousness. That's my daddy. What are we doing listening to the devil? What are we doing listening to him saying, oh, I'm going to destroy you. It's going to be so bad. What? Who are you? He created you, you idiot. Oh, but you better watch it because if you just sit around a little bit, he'll talk you into it. He'll talk you into thinking that it's all going to go bad. It's all going to go south. Well, this all happens. Look, it may happen to a lot of people. It ain't going to happen to me. I had people. There's just people you get around in life that are just negative. I I I got a I got another truck. Sold everything I had, and God made a big wheeling, dealing deal. And, and a person, I didn't have that truck three days, and somebody said, I had a truck right there, thing. I had one just like, oh, sorry, it ain't tired, ain't no good. Ain't no this one, I said, shut up, shut up. 
I mean, Lord have mercy. Why did I just get around the, you know, mouthpiece of the devil that day just to tell me what I did was wrong? I mean, but you'll find them, right? You believe God. You heard God do, tell you to do something. You go do it, and there's always going to be some yahoo standing around there going to tell you, oh, I didn't work. Well, I'm glad I don't have to listen to them. I'm glad I can listen to my word. I'm glad I can listen to, 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 to my heavenly father, my big daddy speaking to me. Amen? Okay, so let's go to another story. Luke chapter 9, verse 37. It's a story that happens right after the Mount of Transfiguration when, when Jesus took the disciples up to the Mount of Transfiguration and had the miracle, and they come back down. And again, because again, I don't want to read all the story, you can go just read it on your own. So he comes down from the Mount of Transfiguration. They've just been up there and had a glory time. They come down, and the rest of the disciples that were left are arguing with the Pharisees and Sadducees. Basically, they went up there and told them that they couldn't do it, and they got doubt and unbelief, and so they couldn't get this boy healed. And so Jesus comes up on the situations, finds the religious crowd arguing with his disciples, and nothing getting done, no boy being healed, sorrow and heartache. And so it says, it happened on the next day that when they'd come down from the mountain, a great multitude met him, and suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he's my only child, and behold, a spirit seizes him and suddenly cries out and convulses him so that he foams at the mouth and, 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 and is, it departs from him with a great difficulty bruising him. So I implore your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. And Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Now, I want to tell you something here, folks. People have argued about this scripture. You say, oh, well, yeah, because it goes on down. Jesus said, well, this kind comes out with only prayer and fasting. And people have argued about this. Churches have got together and had splits over this kind of stuff. Let me ask you a question. If Jesus, if Jesus, if Jesus said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, to the people staying there, does that not... Did he have the right to do that if they couldn't have done it? Are you following me? He would not have said, oh, faith is in perverse generation. At least they had the capabilities to do it, but weren't believing it. You have a worker and you, 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 you go up and find all day that he's been you know, driving nails with a stick, and you say, why didn't you pick up the hammer? But you wouldn't say that if he didn't have a hammer. Do you hear me? Jesus could not have rebuked the disciples if they didn't have the authority and the power to do it, but just weren't using it properly. That's the point of the story. So he goes on, he says, bring him here. And he was still coming down. The demon threw him down, convulsed him. And Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit. He healed the child and it gave him back to his father. Side note. I've always felt like that verse 42 was something that is what this church is called to do. Right? He got rid of the devil. He healed the child from what the devil had tore up. And then he restored him back to the father. We need people today restored back to their relationship with their father. We need to get the devil out. We need to get healed of what the devil has done, and we need to get back into our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Folks, if you get in a relationship with Big Daddy, man, you got it made. And there are people today, I'm telling you, I pray I'm not irritating you, and I pray anybody out there watching, well, of course, you would have just turned me off by now, uh, that you're not offended by saying, oh, well, you're just, you're just, you can't call God Almighty Big Daddy. That's my relationship with him. I'm telling you, you'll see miracles happen in your life if you will get that kind of relationship with him. We've got to see people, the devil cast out, healed, and restored to the Father. Now, I'm not saying everybody's demon-possessed. I'm just saying the enemy comes and attacks, and people are wounded, and those wounds need to be healed. And they need to be restored back to relationship with their Heavenly Father. That, that's it all. That, I mean, when you get into that, if you get your relationship restored back to God, then He can restore everything in your life. Now, it says something here. But while everyone marveled, no, excuse me, then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, He healed the child and gave him back to His Father, and they were all amazed at the majesty of God. Okay? 
the majesty of God. But while everyone marveled at those things which Jesus did, he said to his disciples, let these words sink down your ears, for the Son of Man is about to be betrayed to the hands of men. Isn't it amazing that there's people standing there at that moment? It says they were amazed at the majesty of God. What does the word majesty mean to you? It's not really a word that we use much, is it? I mean, in my daily activities, I don't think I just look at, I don't come across things and say, oh, it's so majestic. I did this weekend because I was looking at those mountains, and I was looking at that beauty, and I was looking at the vastness, and I said, man, I had to stop the truck and ask my wife. I stopped trying to look, and I said, that is the definition of majestic right there that I'm looking at. But it's pretty pretty big. They said they saw the majesty of God, but yet they turned right after that. What happened? Isn't it amazing how easy we forget? Isn't it amazing that at one moment a person can be observing the majesty of God and the next minute they're saying, well, we're going to have to betray him and kill him. Did no one think of the day they were crucifying Jesus? Did no one in that crowd <clears throat> think of it, that the religious people are encouraging everybody to go for a thief and kill Jesus? That just being in a crowd shouting to kill somebody might be a bad church service? The word majesty means greatness, magnificence, a visible splendor, the divine majesty has appeared in Christ. That's what the word means. The majesty of God. Folks, I want to see the majesty of God. I want to see the majesty of God descending right down here in Living Water Church. I want to see the majesty of God going around this world through the waterhole broadcast as people turn it on and flip it on and the majesty of God hits them and, and lives are changed and set free. I want to see miracle signs and wonders take place because we serve an awesome God. Because he is majestic, he is amazing, he is, he's the God who wants to move in our lives. He's the daddy who runs down the road that kisses us when we've done everything wrong. We cannot have situational blindness. We cannot get into the place where we're blinded, where we're letting the world and whatever's in the world and the, the lust of the worlds and, the, and the, 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 the glowing, glittering, flashy things of the world take us away from what's important, folks, is our relationship with our Heavenly Father. You can't let yourself get in anger and become so angry at something and so in un un unforgiveness that you can't you, you lose your relationship with your, your father. Don't let the devil trick you no matter what it is, whether it's, it's, it's the sin of unforgiveness or the sin of chasing the glitter of the world. Folks, we serve an awesome God. Now, let me show you something here. Go to Isaiah 41.10. This week, a person sent this scripture to me, and I read it. I knew it, but as you read it, when God does something like that, it, it just becomes special. Isaiah 41, 10, it says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I mean, just hear it. Hear those words. This is God Almighty saying to you, Fear not, I'm with you. Who's with me? This awesome, amazing, majestic God. Not religion. God created the heavens and the earth and all therein. Fear not, I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you by my righteous right hand. Behold, all those who were incensed against you shall be ashamed and disgraced. They shall be as nothing. And those who strive with you shall perish, and you shall seek them and not find them. Those who contend with you, those who war against you, shall be as nothing, as a non-existent thing. For I, the Lord, your God, will hold your right hand, saying to you, Fear not, I will help you. Hello? Now, I usually always read the New King James translation, but I flipped over in this one, 
to the Message Bible. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes I don't, I don't like the way they translate things, but man, they knocked it out of the park on this one. Listen to this. This is the same verse, Message Translation. Count on it. Everyone who had it in for you will end up out in the cold. Real losers. <laughs> I read that and I was like, oh, all right. Those who worked against you will end up empty-handed. Nothing to show for their lives. When you go out looking for your old adversaries, you won't even find them. Not a trace of your old enemies. Not even a memory. That's right, because I, your God, have a firm grip on you. I'm not letting go of you. I'm telling you, don't panic. I'm right here to help you. I thought that was just, that was a good translation. I'll give them an A plus on that one. But we got to, see what I'm saying? The enemy will come around, he'll lie to you, he'll beat you down and tell you God's not with you. But then that's what God's word's saying to you. And you stop and you say, well, I, I just don't see God moving. Well, but, 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 but what are you doing? Have you been to daddy's house? Are you still eating the pig food trying to get God to bless you in the pig pen? Get out. That whole verse there, he says, he has your hand. He has your right hand. All right? He has you by the right hand. Now, I've thought of this a couple of ways. I don't know how to look at it. I don't know. Could be God standing beside you. He's got you with his left hand. He's holding your right hand like a little boy walking with his father. You know, we've got the footprints in the sand thing that everybody always looks at, you know, where God's carrying you. But he said he's got your right hand. All right? Or he could be standing. It could be like shaking hands. You know, I don't know. Point is, he's got my right hand. He's got me. Hello? So whatever's coming doesn't really make any difference. Wouldn't it be nice just to wake up in the morning and say, God, I just thank you. You've got everything under control today. Praise you for it. I'm not going to worry about anything. God, you, you've got me by my right hand. That's what your word says. I'm just going to believe it. And I'm just going to enjoy the day. This comes at you. That comes at you. Just say, oh, well, hey, Daddy. Daddy, i got a problem. Uh, this is happening. And, and you were okay? You were at peace? You were at rest? Wouldn't that be nice? Yeah, man, sure, it just doesn't work that way. You know, you got to go there. Well, I'm just telling you, I've lived like that for a long time, and it just doesn't bear much fruit. Okay, so let me get through this right quick. I got, I hadn't even got to the points yet. <laughs> Psalm 16.8. Psalm 16, 8. So how do we do this? How do we walk this way? Let me just give you a few revelations here you got to get. Psalm 16, 8 says, I set the Lord always before me because he's at my right hand. I shall not be moved. All right. So you're going to want to remember that you're going to want to write Psalm 16, 8 down because it's, that's a big point here. Now, the first thing now jump over to Ephesians 2, 4. I'm going to go kind of fast here. So you all hanging with me. There's some revelation you got to have to walk in this relationship with your Heavenly Father. You see, the, what, the, what the devil wants to do is he wants to play the part to where you feel that you don't have any right to be with the Father. Okay? He wants to play that constantly, reminding you of your faults, your, your inconsistencies, your sin, your, your, your you know, whatever to try to make you believe that you don't have any ability to go talk to this great God. He wants to do bad experiences in church. He wants to use people that are giving bad examples. He wants to do all this. He wants to use this to keep you out of a relationship. All right? So the first thing you've got to understand is Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. It says, but God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love for which he loved us, even when you were dead in your trespasses, made us alive together in Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ, that in the ages to come, he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Jesus Christ. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. It's not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works. At least anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before that we should walk in them. 
Therefore, remember that you were once Gentiles in the flesh who were called uncircumcised by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now, everybody say, but now. In Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace who has made both one, broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law, the commandment contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two and therefore making peace. Listen to me. You've got to realize the very first thing is you've already, you already have peace with God. Your peace has already been made. It's called Jesus. I've, I'm at peace with God. God's at peace with me. There is nothing. He isn't mad at me. How many of y'all ever did something wrong in life and you knew your father was going to find out about it and you knew you are going to get in trouble? And you knew that was some tense times until peace had been made. You either got in trouble, took your licks or whatever happened, and then it was over with, right? Hello? And when it was over with, there was peace. Well, I'm telling you, you have peace with God because of the blood of Jesus. It's already over with your position with your father. He isn't mad if you're in Christ. Now, if you're a heathen, you, you, you got some troubles. If you don't have Jesus in your life, you've you got some problems, man. He's, you're in the wrong place. Y'all with me? But if you're in Christ, quit giving the devil place, letting him take you out of seeing, well, God's probably mad at you and this and that. And the other. Get out of that mindset. You're not going to have any relationship with somebody you think's mad at you. If I think somebody's mad at me, I don't want to see them. Do you? I'm just saying, if I think somebody's mad at me, I don't really want, oh, God, so-and-so's mad at me. Oh, there he is. Right? If you think God's mad at you, you're not going to go have a relationship with him. You've got to understand, you've already got peace through Christ Jesus. Amen? The second thing is, the separation between you and God has been closed. There is no great gap. That's why Hebrews 10, 19 says, Therefore, brethren... We have boldness to enter in the holiest by the blood of Jesus in a new and a living way. The gap has been closed. You've got peace and there is no great, you know, uh, how many of y'all have ever even seen, you've, you've seen the Grand Canyon? How many of y'all have seen the Grand Canyon really laid eyes on it, okay? That's a big hole. Hello? That is a big gap from one side to the other. There is no separation between you and God. You're not on one side of, the, of the, the canyon and he's on the other. Hello? It's been closed. There's no more separation. It says the blood of Jesus it, it tore down that wall of separation between you and God. There's nothing there. There's anything. You can go boldly to the throne room of God and have a relationship with your heavenly father because Jesus did that for you. Okay? The third thing you've got to understand, you don't know it all. You haven't got it all figured out. I don't have it all figured out. We humans don't have it all figured out. We don't, I, don't, I cannot tell you how all the things work. Like I just told you about the, the arrowheads a while ago. Someone said, oh, this is it. This is the oldest one. Ah, oh, well, no, no, this is the oldest one. All right? I can't always tell you I know everything about God. But one thing I do know, <laughs> praise God, Jesus is on my side. And it says in Hebrews 7.25, that he always lives to make intercession for me. So I got somebody to help me through it with my daddy called Jesus. His blood crying out for me, saying that I'm righteous, that I'm, that I'm holy, that I'm unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. I believe the whole problem is why the world is in the shape that it's in right now is because preachers have not preached Jesus and the Father correctly to humanity and therefore, people have been turned off and they've gone away. Rather than seeing the love of God, seeing how great God is, going and having fellowship with God and just letting God take care of it. We try to fix everything by do's and don'ts and rules. 
And we just ought to teach people to have fellowship with God. You hang around him, you're going to start to be like him. Hello? The fourth thing is, Hebrews 12.1. Now, this is, this is a real important, this is the last one I'm going to give you. Hebrews 12.1. It says, Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus. Remember Psalm 16 I read just a minute ago? He said, I set the Lord always before me. The only way you're going to run this race in life and see victory is you have got to set the Lord before you. You've got to look unto Jesus. You've got to look into how great he is, how he's tore down that wall, how he's made it right for you to have a relationship with your heavenly father. You've got to keep him out there in front of you. You've got to keep looking at him, see him. You've got to, I mean, you need to go get you one of them plastic Jesus bobbleheads and put it up on there so you keep him always before you bobbling around or something, you know? You've got to keep the Lord out there before you. Hello? You've got to keep it on your mind. That's a 60s thing. <laughs> but are you with me here? You got, folks, listen to me. If you it, quit setting the worry and the anxiety before you and looking at it, quit setting the troubles and the woes before you and looking at it. If you stare at the problem all the time, all you're going to have is a big problem. You got to start looking at the majesty of God. You got to start realizing who's your daddy. You got to start learning, saying, Man, my gosh, Father, I can't even believe that I get to come into the throne. I don't know about y'all, but, you know, there's not much that intimidates me in life. But sometimes I have been in just not very much, but sometimes I've been in some places before that kind of intimidated me because I felt like anywhere I moved, I might break something. And it looked expensive. Are y'all with me? And I kind of got, I'm not in, like intimidated by it, but just like I can't really be myself. I can't really relax because I'm scared I'm going to touch something and break something. All right? And you can't have a relationship with your Heavenly Father like that. Like you don't want to go to His house to talk to Him because you're thinking something, you're going to get in trouble or you're going to break something. You've got to have a relationship with your Father that you, you, you just go right into the throne room and sit down in your big comfy chair. Hello? That's got to be your relationship. That you just go talk to your Heavenly Father. You go in anytime you want to. My kids don't call me and ask me if they can come to my house. They just show up. Are y'all with me? They don't make an appointment. Try to schedule it in. They show up. That's the way it's supposed to be with your father, your heavenly father. You just show up. Hey, Dad, I got a situation I need to talk to you about. Got this situation going on over here, and I really need some help. I don't know what to do about it. That's the way your relationship has to be with your father, not... Oh, God, who sitteth in the heavens, thou that art mighty and powerful, don't kill me, please, as I talk to you. The majesty of God, him holding your right hand. Everything else is just a real loser, and you're walking in victory. Amen? Amen. Well, put your Bibles up. And just stand to your feet if you would. Right now, I want to pray for you. Just a couple of things. Number one is, listen, folks, I don't want anybody to leave this building today if you don't know Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Matter of fact, come, I have my prayer team come up this morning and come up front here with me. But if you, if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, listen, don't, don't leave this building. If you don't know this big God, if you don't think you have any rights, because see, listen, to be honest, to be honest, can I just speak boldly to you for just a second? 
If you've never asked Jesus Christ to be the Lord and Savior of your life, then you don't have a right to have a relationship with the Father. And maybe people need to hear that in life because everybody keeps thinking, oh, it's God, he's a loving God, and everything will be okay. That's not what the Bible teaches us. It teaches us that if we've never confessed with our mouth and believed in our heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that he laid his life down for us for our sins to be forgiven, then we're saved. And if you've never accepted Jesus Christ, your Lord and Savior, you have no right to go to the Father's house. You say, well, that's harsh. It's the Word of God. Okay? If you can't believe and just be a nice person, that being a nice person is going to get you to heaven. That's not what the Bible teaches. It's believing that Jesus paid your price. So if you're out there listening and watching and you've never made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life, then right where you are, stop and say, Jesus, I believe that you're the Son of God. Come into my life. I want to walk with you. Forgive me of my sins. Wash me and cleanse me in your blood. Make heaven my home. And if you do that sincerely from your heart, he'll touch you right where you are. If you're in here, we've got prayer people up here to pray with you. Don't leave here until you know for sure that you're right with God. But I want to pray something else over y'all. Because I believe this morning that I preached this message for a reason. I believe that some of you in here this morning have let the enemy make things bigger than they are that simple. You've worried, you've made yourself sick, and you've fretted, and you've, you, you, you've gotten yourself up in knots, and you forgot how big your Heavenly Father is. So I want everybody to ask everybody just to bow your heads, and I want to pray over you. If that's you, I don't need you to do anything except grab hold of this. If you're listening or watching, and this is your answer to prayer, well then, Grab hold of it as I pray over you. Father, I declare right now in Jesus' name that all the oppression of the enemy is broken right now in Jesus' name. The lies that he sowed in our hearts, the lies that have happened, the things that have come about, the things that have taken place, I declare right now, Lord God, that that is oppression and that, uh, that, that demonic infiltration has been broken right now in Jesus' name. Those that have been worried over everything from finances to sickness to, 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 to futures, to husbands, to wives, to children, to grandchildren. I declare right now in Jesus' name that is broken. I declare that the devil, you have lost ground today. You no longer have the right to come in there and lie to them and oppress them. I declare today that they, have the, they are the sons of God. They are washed in the blood of Jesus. And today they're going to walk in the freedom of having a relationship with an awesome heavenly father. I declare right now that that is broken. I declare right now that this message soaks into their hearts, soaks into their minds. I declare right now, Lord, they're going to rejoice and know that, God, you were that great, you were that big, and you were on their side. And, Lord, that every person that runs to them goes boldly into the throne room of grace is going to find grace, going to find your hand, going to find love, going to find your, 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 your amazing, amazing, miraculous love. And so, Lord, I thank you for it. Now, Lord, just bathe them in it. Holy Ghost, seal this in them right now. Seal this in them right now. Lord, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. So when you go out there this week, listen to me, church. You go out there this week and a problem comes up, go talk to your big daddy. Hello? Look at the person beside you and say, man, we serve a big God. When you go out there this week, listen to me. Go bless people. Tell them all the good news. Amen? God bless you. We're here up front to pray for you if you need anything.